All right, so I'm back with Greg Ferguson for part two of our series on spiritual exploration. And we're looking at uh, Greg's system, or I guess, Greg, what would you call your sort of your, your um, yeah, what, what is it? <laughs> what are we talking about, a belief system? What is this? Uh, all right, a system. I, 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 that means that it's given it significant amount of thought if it's going to be called a system. But yeah, I've given it quite a bit of thought. I've been working on it for a number of years. So I guess we could call it a system, but I, I would call it more of an approach. Let's, yes. call, let's call it an approach or a, a perspective. Right. Yeah. When I was writing the blurb for the first video in this series, I was calling, I wanted to call it Greg's Way, you know, with a capital W, but the approach, the philosophy, whatever you yeah. want to call it, it's your, your approach to living, essentially. Yeah. Awesome. And so this is part two, and I will let you have the floor, Greg. What are we looking at here? Okay. What we're looking at is the, this, this is a picture, we won't spend too much time on the first picture. The first picture is a, a picture of an iceberg here where it's it's got a, a picture of collective beliefs at the bottom. It's got unconscious beliefs in the middle, conscious beliefs that are just below the surface. And then what's above on the surface of this picture is is, is opinions. And this is not new. All right. So th this is this is just my interpretation of of what it is that we're, we are programmed with. We are programmed with a significant amount of beliefs in fact every single thought that we think is based in a belief every single thing that, every thought that comes into our mind has a basis somewhere otherwise we it would it would be looking around and it's it's got to cling on to something it's got to it's got to pull from somewhere and so where it's pulling from is going to be these collective beliefs which is what we're born into our our particular society that we live in you live in a different society than i do but we're both on the north american continent uh, and the people in different different uh, continents and different different uh, completely different parts of the world would have a different collective belief. That could also have to do even if we lived in the same neighborhood, that collective belief could be different based on uh, how you were raised and race, and it could have to do with your religion. It could have to do with whether you grew up rich or poor. Uh, those are influences that have are in, ingrained that, that you you don't you didn't have any choice as to where and how you were born. And to when you were born, and you didn't have any choices to the race or the color or the location or the intelligence level or any of that. So that's all going to. I'm going to call that all unconscious. And this is this is could be uh, Freud stuff. It could be the superego, the id, and all that and all that stuff. It's just an easier way to, to look at it for me. So you got the unconscious beliefs, and then you got the uh, the the next level up there is the uh, the. I'm sorry, that would be the collective beliefs and the unconscious beliefs are the ones that get programmed in along the way as you're growing up. And, and those are going to be the ones that are, uh, that are also based on your society, that are based on the schooling that you get. Some of these are going to be inferred. Like, we don't do that. That's not, our, that's not the way we do things, or those people are not uh, like us. So those are still going to be below, significantly below the surface, because when you, when you meet somebody new, you're going to go, well, they're, they're not like me. And, and your approach to that is going to be either, well, that's interesting, and I'd like to get to know that person, or uh, they're, they're, uh, that's, that's danger, or the, I should be cautious of that. So these are still things that have been, uh, that have been ingrained in us. So these are going to be the, uh, the unconscious ones. And then, of course, we have the conscious ones, the ones we choose. We have the, we have the ones that we choose, the beliefs that we choose, and, and, and that could be based on the, the, okay, we grew up this way, and then these, we had these collective beliefs, and then the unconscious, and now we're choosing to continue those, mm -hmm. right? So now we're going to continue to choose those, and those are going to be ones that we add to. So we're going to look to reinforce those things, and then the ones on top are, are the ones that you see on an everyday basis. Those are, those are going to be my point of view, my position, my opinion. That's going to be the team I cheer for. That's going to be the kind of, you know, all those things that make, make you like, like your personality, really, mm -hmm. the, on the surface, the easy stuff to spot. All right. Now, the, the, you might go, you know, that, so what? That doesn't make any sense. And that's common knowledge. And that's easy, to, that's, that's easy to understand. But I wanted to start there because I wanted to start and then go to the next slide. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that slide. I want to go to the next slide. And that next slide is going to be the one that, uh, that, that we start to talk about. This is kind of what it looks like to me. This is the one that's, that says the beliefs, emotions, and thoughts, the BETs, I call them. Now, we talked about this before, and I wanted to, to, to hit this one more time 
Right. All right. So I put that first one in as a, as a precursor, but just to get a baseline as where we are. This one is the, the, the one we talked about before. This is the, the how it works. Right. And the way that it goes through the, uh, the cycle. And just as a, a little bit of review, if people didn't watch the hour or whatever it was last time, is, is that you have your social beliefs, the ones that came off the last slide, right? The one that, the, whatever those are, whether they're unconscious, whether they're, whether they're uh, uh, collective or whether they're chosen, uh, then, then uh, those, whatever those are, and you have an outside, uh, uh, some sort of an event, you have an, and it's going to trigger some sort of an emotion. Okay, so I'm just a little bit of review, but I'll talk about uh, how this guides into the next one. So we have a, a it, it triggers some sort of an emotion. That emotion could be uh, pleasant or unpleasant. It could be uh, fear. It could be hate. It could be uh, uh, any number of negative ones. And that's typically the ones that we're concerned about. We're not as, as concerned about the ones that trigger the ones that are, that are love or, or the ones that are, are, are the, the, the ones we cherish, the ones we like to, to have, those emotions, those positive emotions. Those are typically not the ones that we're reading self-help books about, right? We're not, how, do you, how do you get over the, uh, this, this uh, empathy thing that I've got? I, I got so much empathy, I got to get over it. You know, how to but, stop being so happy all the time. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't have self-help books in, the, in that section. Uh, at least not, they're not, they don't sell real well anyway. <laughs> and then, uh, and then those emotions, they end up fostering the, the thoughts and that's the frequency you're turned into, uh, tuned into. The reason I say that is, is that, that, um, that there are a lot of people that think that thoughts, they, they start and originate in the brain. And I'm going to, I don't think that that's, that that's necessarily the case. I think that the thoughts are out here in the in, in the ether or in the atmosphere or in the whatever you want to call this thing that's that's that we're all a part of and we tune in to that level and we are we we can we can either stay there and maybe be unaware that we have the ability to turn that on or off now the self-help world would say just don't think those thoughts mm. right? the self-help world would say think better thoughts and you'll be a better person and mm. i've read a lot and a lot a lot of those books and, and I've read enough of them to say that, that, uh, that you can try to move your, your thinking from a negative thought and try to turn it into a positive thought. And I think that, that, that works probably to a certain extent. But I think it is kind of like painting over rust. When you paint over rust, the rust is coming back. Right. right? Yeah. You can, you can think a positive thought and you can turn it around. But if you don't change the belief that, that, that created that emotion which, which got to that thought, then I don't, I, it's coming back, just like Russ comes back, right? Absolutely. Yeah, there's certain, yeah, certain beliefs that are like sabotage. And until you uproot that belief, until you find it and uproot it, no matter what else you do, it's always going to be hindering you or affecting you uh, unconsciously or subconsciously. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So that's how that works. And, and, the, and the, the basis of after we look at the next slide, and, and maybe uh, on a, a follow-up call because I want to go to that next slide. But but the, these first three slides are the base uh, the baseline for the description of how does this fit into into uh, uh, spirituality? Because you're sitting here talking about well this is just psychology or psychiatry, and to a certain extent it is. Uh, but we I think we need to understand what it is and where it is what it is, and then the the thing that's I guess new or different or that I've never seen before because I've seen the a version of the iceberg before I drew the the circle the BETs but that's that's uh, that's psychology from that's come around in, in different formats and there it's behavioral therapy or something so that's not brand new that concept but uh, but the uh, when we start to apply this when you call it Greg's way or Greg's approach that's what's going to be completely different how does it apply to spirituality how does that, that change and how does that get us to grow make sense so far yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to circle back to the iceberg picture because you, you've said yeah. a few things there that um, for me kind of struck a chord. Okay. Um, so two things you were asking about, uh, not asking, you were saying how some people believe that thoughts originate in the brain and you were saying we kind of tune into them. They're kind of in this ether and that we're all sort of connected to and then we tune into certain types of thoughts. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, this ties into your iceberg picture at the collective belief level because it's almost yeah. like all of the beliefs in the world are there for us, but the ones that we are programmed with through life and by our parents become unconscious beliefs. We don't necessarily internalize all of the collective beliefs that we're um, surrounded by, 
the ones that we do get sort of infected with become our unconscious beliefs and then and then everything else kind of grows from there uh, but i just found that interesting because yeah it's almost like we're dipping our toes in the collective uh consciousness of the entire species and certain cultures are uh more dominant in where we are and certain ideas might be more dominant like you said because of religion or whatever uh mm -hmm. and so those are the ones that we end up absorbing but you know there's a lot of other beliefs that we might be exposed to during our youth and so on the collective mm -hmm. beliefs of our sort of area and we don't absorb them all so i find that interesting that we filter some some of them are are more easily absorbed than others so that might be a, a further discussion down the line maybe well, here's here's the way it looks like to me is that if we're born and we have a uh, just like a radio, like an FM radio, an FM radio has got a certain bandwidth that it can go up and down. It can go up and down from whatever it is, 87, whatever it is, to 107, whatever, you know, the measurement, mm -hmm. the, the frequency. And those are the, the different things. We can turn that knob up and down. We can turn that dot knob up and down probably consciously because when you talk about the, the, the self-help books that say just change your thoughts and change your life. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you're going from 87 to 107 or something. You can do that, right? Yeah. Well, that's just part of the electromagnetic spectrum. All right. Yeah. The electromagnetic spectrum is is way wider than the FM dial. Right. All right? It goes from from uh, infrared to ultraviolet, and and, and it goes probably uh, uh, way further than our instruments can can measure. Right. Uh, I I believe that it goes way higher than that. It probably probably thought is is one of those frequencies that's way high that we just can't, we don't have a way to measure at this point. But, yeah. our, but the analogy is such that, okay, uh, that, that we're, we're able to tune it up and down a little bit, maybe in the FM dial, but we don't even have AM or XM radio, <laughs> but we have plenty of other, of other ways to do it. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I like that okay. analogy. That's awesome. If we're talking about the genesis of beliefs, this is, this is how the, it works, at least in my brain. And let me, let me walk you through it and see if it makes some sense. Mm -hmm. All right, so up at the uh, up at the top there, you have observe sights, sounds, events, etc. Essentially, you're you're able to to uh, ac access incoming information. That could also be your your uh, in any kind of anything that's inbound. It could be any knowledge. It could be any observation. It could be anything that says comprehend incoming information. That's the next one. That just means I, I understand uh, it's coming in. And, and now I understand that it's, it's sight, it's sound, it's information, it's teaching, it's whatever. Mm -hmm. All right, now you go to assess the source. Assess the source. Now, right here, is, it's, it means you compare it to previous uh, assumed knowledge. This is very, very important and right here. This assess the source is because if it's, if it, could be, it could be one of three things. It could be one of one that you trust. It could be one of that you don't know. And it could be one that you don't trust. Or at least in my in my uh, way of putting this together, if it's one that you trust, then you're most likely to agree with it. Almost uh, whatever the percentage is, I don't know, but it's probably 90, 95 percent that you're going to agree with it. And here's here's a, a prime example: is, is if you're of a, a particular political persuasion, especially in the in the divided times that we are in, if you get information from a source that you agree with, you're way more likely to agree with it than mm. to disagree would you agree yeah. with them oh yeah of course and that's some kind of isn't that some kind of well-known bias it's confirmation bias right anything confirmation that confirms, bias exactly yeah anything so that confirms know, what you, you already believe it's worse you're going to compare it to previous assumed knowledge meaning that that's a you figure that you you think that you know a little bit about this and if it's coming from a trusted source trusted to you then you're probably going to agree. And if it's coming from a source that you do not agree with or that you don't like or that, that you haven't agreed with in the past, you're probably not going to agree with it. Now, there, that, that's, that's not, that's not an uh, uh, absolute, but now that's going to cause you to consider your current perspective. I'm going down on this chart here. Mm -hmm. And it's going to say, okay, I'm going to consider my current perspective. And is it going to, is it going to add to it or is it going to take away from it or is it going to alter it a little bit? But it, in, in one shape or another, more than likely, this, this next step is going to be that you're going to form an opinion. That opinion is going to be, it's going to be probably good, bad, right or wrong, uh, uh, pl pleasant or unpleasant. It's going to be du this duality thing that we talk about all the time. And this is going to be the, the attractions and the aversions, right? So you're going to form an opinion based on whether you agree or not, based on the, the source that it came from, okay? So that's how this is going down. Now, once you form an opinion, if it's a good or bad or right or wrong or, 
or pleasant or unpleasant, then you're going to, at that point, form a judgment on, uh, on it. Typically, you're going to formulate a should or a should. That's almost always what happens. As soon as you hear something that you agree with and you form an opinion, you say that's good. And you're going to say everybody should be like that or they shouldn't be like this. This is the way that the human mind works. We formulate a, a should or shouldn't typically uh, position based on that. And that becomes our judgment. Now, you combine that with other judgments. And what that does now is that just strengthens your opinion, or your, your current position. So now you, you can um, now you can either praise or criticize uh, the, the source or you can praise or criticize the the, um, the, the object of the, the, the knowledge. You can either agree with it or disagree with it. You can say that it's uh, good or bad. You can formulate a should or a shouldn't. And now you will either rationalize your position or you defend your position. Now you're strengthening this. Now you've already gone through all this, these steps that I've just put through here. And these steps can happen in a fraction of a second, really. Yeah. Uh, these things can happen in a fraction of a second. And what this is doing is, is it's, it's adding to transforming or, or it's uh, cementing in your, your, uh, your turning. That I'm swinging off to the left here. It turns into your belief. Now you're going to identify with it. And here's why. Because, because now that, it's, that, that you've, you've taken this on, you've, you've essentially agreed to defend this position or rationalize this position, now you're going to be to the point where you can identify with this particular, uh, this particular piece of knowledge or content or position. And now you go into, I'm a, I'm a whatever who believes this whatever. And now you just, now you're just reinforcing this whole, this whole belief system. So this is, this is a, a way that this happens and it happens a, a thousand times a day. If you watch a, a, a TV show or a, a video or something that has anything to do with the news. It's hard to find the news that's down the middle right now. And I'm, I'm using this because in, in our current time, it's a pretty good example of the, the way this works, the way beliefs are, are affecting everything that we, we look at and see and do. So you, you, you watch a particular uh, a network and that, that loop is going to happen 50, 100, 200, 1,000 times in 10 minutes. Mm. Every word, every sentence, every every position that they come up with, you're gonna either uh, uh, you're gonna go through that system, and you're gonna go into this loop. It's very, very rare that you go, "Oh, wait, wait a minute, hold on a minute," and you stop and question that. Mm. And the the minute that we stop and question that that system, that that thing that's that we're going through, that that uh, that loop, that's the first time that we stop and do that loop. That's the first uh, place that we can have as a level of freedom. And that's what's going to first start to separate us away from our belief system, the collective beliefs, the unconscious beliefs, the conscious beliefs. And then that's actually going to clearly going to end up changing our, our, our opinions, the ones that are above the surface. You might end up being a completely different person. Now, you might be a, a similar person and you might actually say these now. I, you know what? I got that. I don't know if these beliefs are true or not, but uh, now they can be at least uh, preferences. And you and I talked about that. And if they become preferences that you're not attached to, that you're not identified with, that you're not, that you're not like, that's, that's who I am. That's who I identify. And that could be anything. That could be your religion. That could be your, your culture. That could be your, your political position. That could be the, the, that I'm a sports fan, that I, I cheer for the one team and not the other. I, you identify with that thing. And then that's going to that's gonna create, the, uh, that's going to be part and parcel of that belief system. Now, you say that this is psychology, but I, I don't really make much of a distinction between psychology, spirituality, philosophy. And to me, what you're describing here is one aspect of the whole, right? And we're dealing with the mind, which is by its very nature, non-physical. Uh, anytime you're dealing with the non-material, to me, it, it, it sort of leans into spirituality or connects to it very directly. So even though this is very cognitive and very left brain, as you said, I don't see how it doesn't tie into the whole shebang bang you know, you, you, this is the, the whole foundation. As soon as you start clearing away some of these beliefs and as soon as you start distancing yourself from some of these identities, that's when the breakthroughs and all the stuff that we've talked about over the last couple of videos start to happen. I would agree. And, and so this is going to be where Ramana Maharshi's thing talks about who, who am I? And, and for me, that didn't ever really sink in until I kind of put it into me. This is my context of, oh, okay, now I understand what he was talking about because this is who am I without my beliefs. He didn't really ever 
say that part of it, but if somebody's having trouble with the who am I, well, I'm a dad, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a coach, or I'm a, I'm a husband, or I'm a, I'm a worker, or whatever it is that you identify with, you go, well, am I really that? That's not, I, I, I don't know if that's what he was getting at, because I, I, I mean, you can only read him or listen to him so much, he's not living anymore, but, but his, I think maybe this is kind of where he was headed, is, is it, you know, who would you be without all your beliefs? I and think so, yeah. Beliefs? That's yeah. certainly how I interpret it. I mean, to me, it's like you, the, the exercises you're supposed to go through and every answer you produce, you're supposed to pick it apart. Like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher. Well, no, that's what you do, right? That's mm -hmm. not who you are. No, I'm a father. Well, that's one aspect. I mean, you have kids, but that's not all you are. So you keep going down the line like this and eliminating all the things that are inaccurate and untrue. And eventually you arrive at this experience, I suppose, of mm -hmm. what you actually are, which is, you know, you, you can't really put a name on it, unfortunately. That's the, that's the trick, right? Yeah. David Hawkins, he says probably the, the uh, question is probably more accurately, what am I? Right. Not necessarily a who am I, what am I? And so what are you? That becomes a little bit uh, less personal, I guess, but it also becomes a little bit more of a, it opens up some of the possibilities a little bit more. Well, it, it forces you to blur the lines, right? Because as you try to describe what you are, it always is like it's your... Um, it's what you talk about with regards to content and context. Every time you claim to be something, you realize, well, actually, you're, you're embedded in the greater context. And every time you zoom out, you realize you're more than what you thought you were, right? Oh, I love when you say that. Because <laughs> that's exactly the way it looks to me. That's how, yeah, man, you're preaching to the choir. Right. Because every time you zoom out, and then, of course, the more you zoom out, what do you find when you are all the context? And then you get to, you can pretty much get the non-duality and you get to, you're all that is. So that's a, that's a, I mean, looking at it when you, when you thought it through, you go, well, that's pretty easy. But it, <laughs> yeah. it, could take, it could take a, a lifetime or a hundred lifetimes or eons to figure that out. Not yeah. that I have everything figured out, but it looks like that's kind of where you end up if you keep doing that. Well, and I think there's a danger of using the term figure it out because that really implies, a, again, a, a left brain sort of um, conceptual yeah. understanding. Whereas what we're talking about, I mean, we're, we're tossing these words out very ca caught casually and carelessly like it's no big deal. But, you know, the words do not do it justice. I mean, you've told me about some of your experiences. I know my experiences I still can't put into words. So when we talk about, you know, the unity of all things and all this stuff, it's like, that's nothing. Those are just mouth sounds. Like they are pointing to an experience that is beyond all words. And it's, I just, I, I don't know, man. I love talking to you because it's, first of all, it's great to talk to other people who've had those experiences. And right. second, it's great to be able to hopefully help others find their way to that experience somehow, you know, even if just by having these conversations and pointing the way, I mean, uh, it's, you know, I want to share it with everybody. <laughs> well, I've given it, to, I mean, I've been, uh, I guess, I know you, you had your your, your uh, cubicle uh, epiphany. What do you call it? Your wake Yeah, uh, that's right. Sure. <laughs> cubicle epiphany. And I sent you that video that, that kind of talks a little bit about the nature of that is, is that uh, um, in most cases, I think, there's, it's very rare that you walk around like, uh, I guess it was Maharshi or, or even like uh, Eckhart Tolle. He just wakes up one day and he's in a totally different uh, context or different frame of mind. I, I think that it's a whole lot, for, for almost everybody else, it's significantly more gradual. Mm. And you have a little bit and then a little bit more and a little bit more and it just stays and sometimes it goes away and, and you know, two steps forward, three steps back and three step, three and a half steps forward and one step back. And, and, and it's not somebody, a perfectly linear process. No. And then somebody irritates the crap out of you and then you go, you go uh, that, that wasn't real, uh, uh, you know, all loving, all, all peace, all everything. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that it's probably possible to become more sort of uh, uh, not unemotional, but I guess like more leveled, you know, more more peaceful. Um, I know that, like you said, it, it, sometimes I'm on my game and I just nothing can nothing can ruffle my feathers, like no matter what. And then other times it's like the smallest thing and you're like, oh, man, this is tough today. <laughs> well, you know what? What I found is, is that sometimes it irritates other people if you don't get upset or mad about stuff. You know, stuff hits you and you go, oh, well, all right. And then people go, aren't you mad about that? Or you don't get mad. You, don't, you, you know, you're so unemotional lately. Not, not that I'm unemotional anymore. It's just that, that a lot of stuff doesn't bug me anymore. <laughs> yeah. And then you still experience the good, the positive emotions on the regular. It's just some of the less helpful emotions like anger and stuff that, you, you know, like you keep highlighting these things like jealousy and, you know, frustrations. 
like those things don't have really any benefit. They don't help in any way that I can think of. I mean, there's never been a situation in my life where anger would have served me better than not being angry. You know what I mean? Like, absolutely. Let's go back to the third round because I, I wanted to ask you some questions about it. So you mentioned this, this graph and how it's, it's very like left brain focused, it's a flow chart. And I think what you're describing in a lot of ways is the left brain process of taking the whole picture, the, the, you know, the, the sights, the sounds, everything. And then to comprehend it, what the left brain does from what I understand is it breaks that big picture into little pieces and it reassembles the big picture bit by bit. But like you said, this, this happens in a fraction of a second oftentimes, but it's sort of this process of take it apart, assess the pieces, assess the source. Do I agree? Do I not? And it's very uh, binary, right? It's either a yes or a no. It's either a good or a bad, like you said. Um, so how is it possible to bypass this process? So for example, you observe sight, sounds, events, etc., and then that's it. Can you, can you do that? Is it possible to just well, observe? The, well, the answer, well, I can go out of two different ways. One is, is that at first you have to, I think, at least my experience has been to consciously question every single thing that comes in. And, and, and that could be a, a month or a year or 10 years where every thought that you have comes into your brain. You go, well, am I sure about that? And Byron Katie has a whole career set on this. So I, and, and I got a lot from her. So I'm not taking anything credit from her. But is it true? And, and, uh, and who would you be without that thought? Yeah. Just that right there. I mean, she's got a whole bunch of great stuff. And, and then I just go, well, it, I don't know if it's true. And, and even if you do think it's true, I got some, and, and this will tie in later. So mm -hmm. I want to say that, that if, if anybody wants to, to know how to do exactly what you just asked, I would say go to, go to, to see the work by Byron Katie, because that is extraordinarily helpful. Now I'm going to take that, that, that how and take it to the next level. And how does now, after you've done that, how does that apply to what it is we're talking about here? How does that mm -hmm. apply to growing in spirituality? How does that grow in transcending levels of consciousness? That's where we're headed. That's the thing that I've never seen done anywhere. And that's the thing that would, when we get past the definitions of beliefs and how do we form beliefs and now how do we break through the beliefs, then we're still going to the next level, which is what does that do for you? Okay, so what? I feel better. But what that's actually doing is, is, is creating different context every time. And every time you create new context, you're moving up levels in in context, but pro uh, likely also in levels of consciousness. Yeah, so this is where the talking stuff comes in, and, and we'll talk about the where we are floating in this level of consciousness. But uh, uh, Hawkins is his thing is transcend your dualities, which means whatever position you have, take the next position up, and whatever you have another position, this is the middle way, the Buddha. You take the you keep taking the third way. All right, that's one way to do that. But what I'm, I'm suggesting here is, is that the process itself, the process of questioning itself kind of does this. It, the, the loop continues to go up and it takes you to higher and higher levels of context. That's where we're headed. And I'm excited about it because it, it, works, it works for me. And, and every time that I get in, in any kind of a thought cycle, I just got to break it off and go, you know, I mean, I do get caught in, from time to time in the, in the political situation or in something you see that comes through the, on Facebook or somebody posts something and you go, oh, man. And uh, uh, so I, I don't get as upset as, about it as I used to, but I still get caught in this loop and I still have to manually do it as opposed to having it to be automatic. I realized as we're talking that it's probably kind of dull to have two people who agree almost entirely on the, on the whole conversation. So I... Uh, so I'm going to play devil's advocate. I'm going to take right, go uh, a line that I used to uh, believe in very strongly many years ago, which is why is it so bad to identify with beliefs and to have conviction? Why are we trying to okay. disidentify and get rid of beliefs? Beliefs are good and we should right. believe in things, Grego. Right. <laughs> and I, and I, I like that because if the belief is not causing you any kind of harm or any kind of discomfort at all, I'd say go ahead and keep it. You know, if it's causing you joy, if it's causing you, uh, uh, if you're if you're able to, if it's causing causing you to, to swell up with with uh, good feelings, you know what? Don't you know? Don't you don't necessarily have to do that. Now, if it's if it's causing good feelings out of pride, which 
is is causing some other kinds of issues or righteousness which i would both pride and righteousness i would put under the it might not necessarily be good for all people if it's good for all people your belief system then then i i don't have any problem with it i mean every religion on the planet has in my view they all have very very common core uh and, and part of that common core is to be be kind to others and and so if and uh, treat others like yourself along those lines have have love and, and have uh, empathy for others so if, if your if your belief system has that included in it, I, I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with that really. So what you're talking about really is using this method or this approach to identify problematic, unhelpful, negative beliefs. Well, negative and not negative. Let's just say unhelpful and accurate because okay. some beliefs are the, negative, but they're true and <laughs> or yeah. true-ish, right? So now the whole the whole self-help world. And there's the whole section that used to be called a bookstore. Now it's called the section online or here, yeah, suggested for you. Yeah. But, uh, the whole the whole thing about the the self improvement, all that, in my view, is about adding new beliefs. All right. Now, if you add new beliefs, and but but the the, the challenge is trying to add new beliefs on top of the old beliefs. All right. And that's where I think it kind of gets either either out of hand or it doesn't work. One or the other. Is is and and this whole law of attraction thing is is in squarely in that camp. Is if I can, if I can uh, uh, believe it, I can achieve it. You know that that goes back to the 1930s with Think and Grow Rich. Mm -hmm. If I can conceive it and I can believe it, then I can achieve it. Well, there's a certain level of of truth to that. There's no doubt. But if you're trying to put that on top of a foundation that is not going to withhold that, then it's it's either going to crumble at some point or it's just not going to take it uh, to begin with. So the missing step in that, the missing step in that process, in your opinion, and I, I think I agree, is that you have to clean up shop before you buy new furniture. You can't just buy new furniture when you have a house full of crap. And that's the same way with, uh, in my in my personal view, with the the lose weight programs, is is it will this diet work? Probably it will, because it worked for somebody, and it probably worked, you know, for a, a, some people. But will it stick? And that's that's the biggest part of it. Can you lose ten or twenty or fifty pounds? Probably, if you, you know, on a short term basis. But if you don't fix the belief system that's underneath that, whatever that is for you, then then it's likely to come back and maybe even come back even stronger. And they don't ever talk about why. It's not lack of willpower, in my view. It has nothing to do with lack of willpower. It has something to do with the belief system that's underlying all that. And you, and then if you try to do all these things with the diet or the exercise or the CrossFit or whatever it is you do. Then, if you're putting it on top of a of a belief system that says that that uh, whatever it might say, if I don't deserve to look like this, or or I I, I can never maintain this, whatever your belief is, conscious or unconscious or collective, either one, then uh, then it won't work. Yeah, and I think maybe we can talk about this, or maybe it's part of your uh, your lesson plan. Um, but where do expectations fit in all of this? Because for me, expectations are a kind of belief about something that will happen something that should happen and oftentimes our reactions are based on the fact that reality doesn't meet our beliefs and it doesn't meet our expectations so for example with weight loss i okay. expect to lose 30 pounds in a week and keep it off well even if you manage to keep or to take it off all of a sudden if you don't maintain it if you don't keep going you're going to put it back on and all of a sudden you go oh well this diet was stupid it didn't work right well, but you have to keep going or you have to do more or whatever, right? So how does expectation play into all this in your, in your mind? Well, uh, the, the expectation is, is that I'm going to lose 30 pounds or whatever that number might be. But, uh, is it, but along with that, it, you're going to have to probably end up changing. And this is for any kind of an addiction of any kind. You, you can't just change the body. You got to change the body, the mind, and the spirit all together or else it just won't, it won't be lasting. And so if the expectation is I take this pill and I lose 30 pounds, if you don't change the other, the other things that need to go along with that, whether it's that, that's lifestyle and whether that's belief system and whether, so you're talking about all those things, then the expectations won't work. Right. If you're aware that you have to go dig deep to, to fix it all the way down to the foundation, which is the belief level, then the expectations I think can, can be, can be uh, uh, fruitful. I guess the conclusion or sort of the conclusion that I walked away with when I listened to this and, and in combination with the first uh, video that we did a couple of weeks ago is that 
your, your position that no belief is true is to help you disidentify and get rid of beliefs that are detrimental to clarity of thought uh, and you know depth of feeling, all that stuff. You want to be, you want to feel it, you want to think clearly. So you've got to get rid of these beliefs. Um, and even the positive ones, the helpful you gotta, ones. You got to question the beliefs, uh, right? It's, it's, I want to clarify that. It, it, so when you, so that they, like when they, when you question them, they might still be there, but again, they may still end up lingering as preference. Sure. And you say, well, I still like chocolate over vanilla or whatever it is. I still like this. I still prefer that. And 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 so I, I want to make sure that we don't try to say that we have to get rid of beliefs, mm. just that they, they may not be true. So right. Yeah. Uh-huh. You suspend your your sort of like um, opening the door of doubt and saying it's possible that this isn't true, whereas before maybe you were adamant that it was mm-hmm. true. Right. Oh, absolutely. So I prefer well, chocolate. Yeah, I knew I was right about everything. <laughs> you knew it. Yeah. I knew it. Yeah. So instead of uh, chocolate is better than vanilla, it becomes I prefer chocolate to vanilla. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or I prefer a religion or I prefer a political party or I prefer the Canucks. Yeah. There you go. But you're open to the possibility that whatever you prefer might not actually be the best or might not be right or whatever. It's just there's right. always that possibility. But there's still some beliefs that are useful, some beliefs that you will hang on to just because they aren't causing you to suffer and all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, and some, I mean, uh, we talked about, I mean, uh, from a, from a, a uh, kind of a, I mean, a, the belief in duality, yeah. the belief in gravity. I mean, the, these are there's some very practical beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not trying to get rid of all beliefs. It's just putting them all to the question and, and being open to the you know new beliefs and, and to the fact that maybe some of your current beliefs might not actually turn out to be that valid. Right. And, and also, just to clarify, in case uh, this gets separated from the first one, and the fact that we say that no belief is true, no belief is true at all levels. It's, it could be very true at your current level. Right. And that's what I'm talking about. Like gravity works right here at this, con- um, at this constant level. But if you're outside the, 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 the physical body, if you're in the the ether, the etheric, or if you're if you're uh, in a, in a uh, out of body experience, or if you're having a near death experience, and the gravity doesn't even exist, I mean, it's not right. even a concept. So that's what I'm saying is is that, that the, the belief doesn't transcend all levels. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't. And, I, and if somebody were to say, "Oh, that guy's," you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about because there's no belief is true. Well, I believe that you know that whatever, but uh, whatever you can say that is absolutely constant at this level. Right. Yeah, I would agree that at a at a relative level, that whatever you believe could be true. That's but, the key word for sure. Yeah. Relative, right? No, no absolute truth, only relative truth, basically. So, that, so that's uh, so that's kind of where I am on the the whole belief system thing, and and uh, it's helpful to to be in that state of mind to be able to take this conversation to the next level because now that we kind of set that baseline about what our beliefs, how do we get them and and how do they work when we go through that little thing? Now we can, we can work with them and say, okay, now, so what does that have to do with spirituality and and how does that actually benefit me? And that's next up on our, in our series. Is that correct? So I do want to, I want to thank you uh, uh, eternally for uh, uh, giving me the, the catalyst to, to put all these, I've had these drawings in my journals for a long, long time to put them on the screen in these, in this format and to be able to discuss them in, in order. That was one of the biggest things that, because they, they, they're not in order in my journal, they're all over the place. So for me to think through and put these things in the, in the order that, that now makes sense, that actually it makes for a, probably a whole lot more interesting conversation than me just blurting that out in the middle start starting in the middle somewhere and, and trying to riff on that so that's been very helpful to me to put it yeah. into some sort of a package that we can talk about i yeah i love doing this with you it's um it's really cool to see it again i feel like a lot of the things that you're saying i'm on board it's just from a different perspective right like you you add your personal touch to it and a lot of the times the way you describe things is different from the way I would think of them. And so I get this a slightly different angle on things. But uh, do you want to kind of give us a preview of the next in our series? What's the next? Uh, where are we going after this? Well, where we're going is, is uh, now talking about what is the belief system when, we, when we're in that, when we're caught in that belief uh, cycle, when we question the belief cycle per the Byron Katie uh, approach, the work, what happens now as it relates to the context that I'm talking about? What happens to the context here? 
Does the, is the context that we're in right now, does that change? And of course it does, but how does it change? But once you, once you do that and now you go, now where does that leave me? That's what I'd like to talk about. All right, Greg. Well, thanks a lot for your time. Thanks for sharing another piece of your approach. Really appreciate it. And um, we already talked about what we're going to explore next time. So we're good to go. All right. We'll talk to you next time. And I'll look forward to the next uh, loaf of daily bread there too. <laughs> Cheers, man. All right. See you later. Bye.